Once again, it's Comics of Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time at the Ann Arbor District Library in uh, lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. On the corner of 5th and William, I am Jersey Drozd. He, he mentions the corner of 5th and Williams because I couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> I mention it every week just because I like to put a little bit of uh, uh, locality to it. So people could, people could come. Eventually, when, when we roll this thing out and we get more listeners, more viewers, then we can have a live studio audience and people can actually come and see it. But yes, be careful when you're on 5th Street right now. Yeah. Why? Why do you need to be careful? Uh, because pretty much it stops at uh, the street before Williams. Uh, Coming south, if you're heading south. If you're heading south off of Huron. Uh, But he is Jersey Drozd. Thank you for that introduction. Hey, you're gonna, you're gonna I, be I'm getting my... back to where you were. I, <laughs> I interrupt. So yes, I'm Jersey Joe's cartoonist and teaching artist, and uh, we've got uh, we're bringing back an old round table. Uh, when yeah. I say old, I mean crusty. I mean oh. drank from the wrong chalice from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Uh, we've got Paul Story with me. <laughs> <laughs> Writer of comics and prose. <laughs> Prematurely aged. He's actually only 22. But I, look, yes, behold I, the ravages of comics. I was, uh, I was fine <laughs> until I met Jersey, and it sucked the life right out of me. <laughs> and Paul, Paul is the writer of uh, My Boyfriend is a Monster, Made for Each Other. Which I thought I would bring back to remind folks, because it would be such an excellent Halloween read. You can get this at your local stores, right? You, you can. Know? Comic and stores? Local stores, your local comic stores, and, and in finer libraries around the country and the world. The good libraries have them. Yep. And uh, also the Green Hornet case files. I see you brought this. Yes, it's uh, something new. Um, It's actually a prose collection. So even though comics are great, prose is still pretty cool too. And um, got to write a a story featuring the Green Hornet, who's one of my longtime favorite characters. And uh, you also are the author of The Muse, which is coming out. Yep, uh, coming out in December. In fact, it is in uh, the previews catalog for those who still use the, the comic stores. Uh, the previews catalog, October 11, 08. Oh, now I forgot. We'll my... link to it in the show notes. Yes. Send, me, send me the link after I this, will. and I'll put it in the show notes I so will. people can order it. You order would think two, I would have two. it memorized by now. Yeah, you would think so. You'd think that you had done on your due diligence to prepare for this thing, but apparently I, not. I don't do due diligence. I do duh diligence. <laughs> duh. Oh, are you from the UP? <laughs> I, I do the diligence. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, you, I guess you can get away with that being from the UP. Uh, <laughs> I'm from close to the UP. I'm from I'm near the Clare area, so yeah, people do start talking. You're that only way. you're you're only from Clare. You seem like you're way farther north. Oh, you, I'm I'm going to get out of work early tonight. Hey, yes, that that I had to shake that accent. It took perhaps, a long time. Perhaps we should introduce the other members. <laughs> well, we got one more thing to to mention about you before oh, we get to okay. our other guests. Um, uh oh. Uh, how do you pronounce this? Valkyra. Oh yeah, Valkyra. Yeah. Uh, Destiny Spear. Destiny Spear. Uh, the, uh, it's uh, an ebook available on, on the Amazon.com. Which you did with Shannon I, Denton. Which I did with Shannon Denton, who recently won a uh, Sheldorf Award for uh, Best Editor um, of this, this past year. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a um, well, let's see, intermediate reader chapter book uh, featuring uh, a, a uh, brother and sister who um, end up uh, getting involved in the remnants of, of Norse mythology and having adventures to save their grandma. So you've written a lot of stuff. I have written I'm establishing your credentials here. You've also worked for DC. You worked on Gotham Girls. I you, did. You worked on... Years um, and years ago, yeah. Yeah, that was like, oh gosh, that was like in 1981. Uh, <laughs> then, then you did. <laughs> 1981, nice. <laughs> uh, how about 2002? I know, I know. Uh, then you also did um, some Robin Hood books. You've done a whole bunch of stuff for um, the those mythology books that you do. What, what for? Uh, it's the Graphic Myths and Legends series for... Um, for the graphic universe uh, uh, line from Learner Books, um, and uh, yeah, adapting mythology into graphic novel form. Uh, also, uh, I have in January a new Twisted Journeys, which is a uh, combination of comics and prose, where the reader can pick their own path through the adventure. Mm. Choose your own adventure. No. Oh. You can pick your own path through the story. Choose your own adventure. No, you can pick your own path. <laughs> <laughs> Am I infringing on trademarks here? <laughs> Probably. I don't know. I wasn't, so you shouldn't. There's a lesson for us all, kids. Don't infringe on trademarks. Now, someone who's never in- afraid to uh, infringe on anybody, anywhere, anytime, is Alice Hunt <laughs> of uh, goodbyechains.com. Uh, hey Kids Comics on the Twitters. 
Yes, I am. With an X. Hey, kids. And with, a Z. And a Z. Yeah, hey, yes. kids with a Z, and then comics and with an X. nothing right. <laughs> <laughs> we were having a show pre, uh, we were having a talk pre-show about uh, how education is for, it's for socks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially, <laughs> that's when you, when you get a doctor who can't spell. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I want somebody working on my teeth who doesn't really know what they're doing. That would be oh, that's that's an adventure, uh, choosing my own adventure. So uh, a secret shame, Alice. It's you... not a, not secret anymore. <laughs> oh, it it wasn't as soon as you saw my name because it's like, hey, those words don't have a Z and an X in them. What the hell? So I Al... mean, hey, children, yes. So Alice, <laughs> you, you do a comic called Goodbye Chains. You write it? Yes, I do. And, and Tracy, who is my companion on this uh, podcast, draws it. Paul does nothing. <laughs> <laughs> on Goodbye Chains. <laughs> Except read it and enjoy it. Oh, thank you. So, yes, and, and we should say, just as, as a quick disclaimer, um, this book, you know, most of the time we talk about stuff that is accessible to all ages. This one is probably not as accessible to all ages. This the one probably. Of, I probably like not. Probably. Well, I mean, if you're 13, you're going to get a bit of a giddy thing out of it because you're like, oh, I shouldn't be reading this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I read comics like that when I was a kid. You know, reading Heavy Metal Magazine when I was 12, going like, oh, if Mom knew I was reading this. You know, we all do I, that. I actually used to have the same thing reading, reading the Conan uh short story collections and like my mom does not realize what's going on in this in this book so yes goodbye chains what's what's goodbye chains about i'll let you do it since you're the writer and all tracy does is just do some scribbles on there what was what it what's it about <laughs> yeah why do we have her on anyway i don't know i don't know <laughs> that, that's why I'm, my coattails for far too long I'm, that's why i'm dragging my feet on introducing her so. Tr tracy kind of humanizes you a little bit you know <laughs> says oh look alice is willing to you know work with a artist no no let's get rid of that then bring you down to the common people that's entirely wrong this this book is written only for PhDs and people who will eventually become PhDs <laughs> no one else can read it or people who no. want to be insufferable at parties no not unless they're getting a PhD <laughs> yes we call it a a fitty a uh, book yeah PhD oh. but you know it's more street if you say fitty <laughs> I guess so, because you are from Detroit after all, I am so from Detroit show, after all. show your street cred. Uh, so, okay, goodbye, Chains. For those who uh, did not watch the episode that you guys were on before, shame on you for not watching that episode. Ooh. I know. Uh, uh -huh. but, but refresh us. Bring us up to speed what Goodbye Chains is about. Right. Well, Goodbye Chains is the story of a communist who likes to blow stuff up and a uh, bank robber who is just generally misanthropic. And they go around having adventures and things blow up and people die. And then eventually, you know, even more bad things happen. And Tracy draws it. Beautifully. And then that, that, that's the cue to introduce Tracy Williams, who I'm so glad to finally get to talk to, uh, um, so to speak, over the Skype. So we haven't talked in face-to-face -face in uh, over a year now. I think we met for the first time face-to-face -face at uh, SPX, yes? Yes, we did. And uh, so you're the artist of Goodbye Chains. You also run a Tumblr, tracywilliams.tumblr.com, and then uh, Trey Comics on the Twitters, right? Yep. T-R-E Comics. So... Um, Hey, before I ask anything else, Tracy, I got to ask you about your personal life because that's what we're really going to talk about today. Is just uh, you know, uh, airing our grievances. Uh, <laughs> what's going Festivus already? <laughs> 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 when are the feats of strength? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do some caper tossing after this. You ready? I'm Scottish. I can do that. <laughs> Cartoonist caper tossing, where it's much, it's a, much a smaller. Number, number two pencil. <laughs> Even then we sweat. <laughs> whew, whew. Uh, so uh, what's what's going on with your desk situation, Tracy? What's going on with your leg? You mentioned that there was a possibility you might not be able to make it. Uh, well, I'm sitting on my bad leg now, but uh, basically from sitting at my desk way too long, I have inflamed a gigantic nerve that's along my spine that goes down to my thigh. So it's really, really painful sitting or uh, laying on comfortable things. So all I can really do is uh, hopefully get my husband to lift my desk up today so I can stand and work. Mm, um, otherwise, it takes a lot of breaks during the day and trying to draw. It's pretty rough. I blame Alice. I yeah. do too. <laughs> I mean, you're putting in a lot of hours. What are you putting in a lot of hours on? Hello. <laughs> Wordy McWorderton is apparently, you know, saying, you know, draw, draw 
tons of uh, people and backgrounds and everything and making life hard on you. Look, if she didn't want this, she could very easily leave. It's not like I have her address and the money for the ticket. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. It's not, yes, I'm not going to threaten her family or pets. <laughs> uh, if, if, if you don't like the troops, then just leave the country. That's all I got to say about it. That, is, that, is that your logic? Well, things happen, and I tend to happen to things. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm sorry to hear that, Tracy. I don't want to make light of, of uh situation. It, it, it is worth pointing out that... <laughs> this gig is not without its occupational hazards. Yeah, and people kind of think we're like like the old uh, money for nothing and the chick, you know. The, yeah. The, and it's like, no, you know, you, you end up all, uh, you know, Check all it. banged up. And, See, I don't know if this is going to show oh, up on yeah, camera. Nice. I got this big old lump on my right hand from where it rests when I draw from like yeah. 20 something years of doing this. And it's like, it's like a big old calcium deposit there. It doesn't hurt or anything, but it's. it's so what you're doing is now. comparing. Um, Tracy's misery and physical discomfort to your, I got a lump. Well, this makes me a little bit less attractive, you know? Hey, that, that, that's uh, it a really problem. doesn't. It really doesn't. <laughs> it, it's gross, though. It, it is. It is a little bit gross. So I got a gross thing. I mean, obviously, no. Again, hey, I'm not hey, trying to make look, light. My thumb was straight hey. before. Oh, oh my wow. God. See, this Little is what happens. Thumbs, <laughs> Form of a bucket of water. <laughs> Shape of some bird that will carry a bucket of water. <laughs> yeah, California condor. But anyway, Tracy, I'm sorry to hear that about uh, your leg. That That is awful. And hopefully working at a standing desk will alleviate some of that. And then hopefully maybe Alice will give you a little bit less difficult stuff to do. Because I've been watching Goodbye Chains and that sequence that you're doing right now with the stained glass stuff. I was reading that going, oh my gosh, that looks brutal. What you've been up to on that? Uh, it has been, and this uh, next page is going to be really rough, and I'm really intimidated. But I think Alice will guide me proper to make it right. Well, Even no. if it takes all week. Hopefully, it won't though. All week, at least. <laughs> So, so for those who haven't read the comic, Colin is experiencing a dream sequence of sorts right now, and it's being told in a stained glass style, which, Tracy, looks gorgeous. It looks really good, but it looks really tough. It is. Now, it's did been Alice a specify fun that? learning experience, though. I, I, I learned uh, uh, Photoshop a bit more, and I actually seem to like to paint in it, but it has all these quirks that I just can't get into with the... Uh, uh, how it does redos and the odd save problems I've been having with it. So I tend to prefer to stick with Manga Studio as much as I can. I need to learn Manga Studio because I'm finding more and more cartoonists are switching to that that drawing program. I, I should learn Manga Studio so I don't need one of these artists. Artists, yeah. <laughs> And people are saying in the chat, Manga Studio is the best. Yeah, I, I, I just need to get under the hood of it. So what is it about Manga Studio that you like so much better than Photoshop, Tracy? Because I've been living in the Photoshop ecosystem since 1994, so it's hard for me to imagine being when, a... When he was in diapers. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's when I was in well, college. Always, uh... Yeah, that's. I'm just saying you drank a lot during college. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of Ecto Cooler, hey! <laughs> so, anyway, sorry. Go ahead, well, Tracy. Yeah, it, it's definitely the... Uh the uh, horsepower that it doesn't require for the two-bit layers so even my weak computer can uh, handle it. Um, another thing that I like about especially the EX version is that you have the perspective rulers which makes drawing buildings and setting up perspective a whole lot easier than trying to figure it out on Photoshop and it's even easier than trying to do it on paper. Mm. Uh, Ooh. Yeah, yeah we, definitely the perspective ruler is a big winner for me. I first heard about that thing, uh, I'm going to say it was episode 24 of Comics Are Great, where we had Christopher Hastings on of DrMcNinja.com, where he talked about using that. And I was like, there's a way to just set up perspective <laughs> on the computer? <laughs> That's just crazy talk. <laughs> well, I've, I've been doing it on paper. I've been doing it with big rulers, and, you know, setting vanishing points on my desk. I was, uh, I was actually uh, visiting with uh, Laura Innes, who does The Dreamer. Uh, mm -hmm thedreamer.com, um, and uh, saw her, her work desk. And she's got this this great thing where she can stretch out. Uh, she's got some extra paper and some extra, like, 
stuff she can stretch out on her desk to, so she can set do. up her perspective yes, lens. Yeah, yeah, just to, so she can go well off the paper. Yeah. Like, oh, no, I do the same. Well, I, I don't. I don't use paper though. My desk is just littered with all these little vanishing points that I put all over, it, and I'll put like a note <laughs> next to it, like page fifteen, vanishing point, panel two. You know, in I, order so I, I, I know what. I hope you've got something that you can then, you know, wash that off with. You know, eventually, for the next one. Eventually, I when it gets too covered in vanishing points, then I was like, oh, it's time to break out like the fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> the, the clean the, and then that's a, that's a little way for me to like you know remind myself that I should wash my table every once in a while yeah. so it doesn't get too gross. Yeah. Because um, anyway, uh, but yeah, people are saying in the chat that yes, uh, Manga Studio is it it needs less resources than Photoshop. It's a little bit more lightweight. And then the, yeah, I saying, believe Trey said that too. Yeah, and she, they're, they're right. backing her up. Yep. And they're also saying the pen tools work like real pen nibs. They're beautiful. So yeah, interesting. Okay, well, there's. Uh, I'll give it a try. So, um, hey, uh, I, I also have to ask. Obviously, if people haven't guessed by now, this is gonna be a kind of a fun one because Paul, really? Paul's back. Yeah, and, and Paul Paul's is like, back, yay. Paul's like Aww. a. He's like the bounce house of comics. <laughs> <laughs> Set up. Comment about my weight. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, and that that makes Alice like the ball pit of comics. Uh, children sink. <laughs> they think they're having fun, and then they sink and disappear. <laughs> you just see their hands disappear. So. <laughs> Oh man, those things got MRSA and all that other stuff in there. I know, I know. They're 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 just covered in in uh, filth, muck, and disease, just like Alice. Uh, hey. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, but I, I'm, Alice is sprinkled with filth, muck, and disease. Not covered. <laughs> not covered. It's, it's a light. I will not let him talk to you. It's like a that, glistening. Alice. I have a very limited amount of diseases. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> She's working on it. Most, everybody. Yes, most of them are under control. Yes. Um, but I, I, I do have a couple fun questions to ask before we dive into topics. Oh, that would uh, be a nice change of pace. Mm, uh, you know, you, Paul, are um, a bit of a Captain America aficionado. <laughs> yeah. You know a little bit about the man. Just a tad. Yeah, you dress as Captain America I in have. your off hours. Yes. <laughs> not, not, not for a while yet, because, again, <laughs> more like bouncing away at this point than Captain America. But <laughs> uh, Matter eater lad. Uh, <laughs> just put it in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I didn't want to go there. You went there. Uh, oh yeah, we also brought a ukulele. Uh, I was going to eat. Okay. Uh, oh, Sergeant Slaughter. Eat Sergeant Slaughter. Since you no, said. I was going to ask what you thought of the Captain America movie because I, I haven't seen it. it. Oh loved really? It, as, a, it, as, a, as a as a hardcore Captain America. As fan. a hardcore Captain America fan, um, they made changes. I was kind of okay with that, um, which is really unusual for me with a comic book movie. I, I usually am one of those people going, really? There was no point. Mm -hmm. There was no point to that. But the thing that they did so right was they realized that Captain America is Steve Rogers. If it weren't for the kind of person Steve Rogers was before he got the super soldier serum, he would not have been the Captain America that we all know and love. Mm. And um, he's got heart and uh, courage and, and nobility. And that was all there before he got the physical perfection. But Paul, we live in a cynical age. I mean, a noble. I dare, I dare you to be cynical while watching that movie. Well, then that means it's going to be a flop, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I did all right. Did, did it? All right. Um, actually, the fact that I could sit there and watch me cynical guy. But you love I, Captain I didn't America. Say, yeah, I didn't say cynical man because then. That's a different thing. Yeah. yeah. But uh, cynical guy that I am, I, I do love Captain America. But that usually means that I'm, I'm a harder judge on something. Okay. Um, I and I loved it, and I came out kind of giddy. Um, wow! People, people were shocked because everybody that knows me goes, "Oh, you see a superhero movie and you love it, and your equivalent of that is going, yeah, it was pretty good." See, <laughs> uh, well, I, I just think that's that's that makes me worry that it's a recipe for disaster because, like, you see, like Indiana Jones four, and everybody's like, "Oh, it's terrible," and then I held it up to the other ones. And I'm like, "It's just like the other ones." I thought it was exactly the same as the other ones, just with new special effects, is all. People hated it, and I, you know, I thought because that, they went from mystical to to science fiction. Is is it really that big of a yes. leap of logic? What? It, it, it's a it's a huge difference. Aliens coming to Earth and no, 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 right there. You, what you got it right there? What aliens coming to Earth? You don't have that happen in an Indiana Jones movie. It's all about the supernatural. But that is supernatural. It's extra natural. It's no, not that's here. Extraterrestrial, not supernatural. Oh my gosh! Are we really gonna go there? Where's my sweatpants? Let's get into this argument. <laughs> See, I, I disagree with that though, because I think it's basically just updating the pulps from the '30s to the '50s, where we were talking about mystical stuff from the East before, and now we're talking about aliens. That I understood, and I, I got what they were going with. For me, it was that 
first off, you know, Shy the Beef, why is he alive? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, and, and, and I've seen two of the three Transformers movies and oh, not I'm sorry. the first one. Oh, I'm I, did, sorry. I did this to myself on purpose because. You're a masochist? Yeah, <laughs> more, more like self loathing. I don't enjoy it. <laughs> I see. Well, but, that... um, a lot of it was that it just it seemed more cynical somehow, especially with all the. CGI special effects instead of the real special effects. I think that if if they had done more physical special effects, it pr it probably would have been at least a bit a bit better received. And Karen Allen was a little wasted, really. Yes, she was. I was I was a little I was a little disappointed that she never squared off against Kate Blanchett and didn't kick her skinny Russian butt. Yeah, she was she was just there to drive a jeep, and that was about it. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And that's not what Karen Allen's all about. Karen Allen is no. Marion Ravenwood is about hard drinking, hard fighting, and uh, <laughs> and conniving. That would I get okay. I'll I'll grant you that that would have been more interesting if she would have been still like a you know hard drinking, hard hitting, and punched Kate Blanchett in the face twice. That that would have been a little bit more interesting. Uh, a firebrand, if you yeah, will. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I guess so. But anyway, uh, you know, it's like, so I, I was worried when they were coming out with Captain America, thinking, like, well, there's no way this movie's going to fly unless they make it more cynical and somehow he's, like, you know, the first Avenger as in, you know, I'm going to beat you within an inch of your life because I'm, I'm America. Uh, you know what? It was, there was a great bit, and I'm going to spoil it for you, Jersey, because uh, everybody else on the face of the earth has seen it. Yeah, that's true. Um, I have I haven't. I'm actually going to watch it tonight. I just got it from Netflix in the mail. Oh, shoot. <laughs> then I don't want to spoil it for Alice. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Alice, I like. I, I never mind Thank spoilers, by the way. You're welcome. But like you, too. Aww. Mm. Aww. But, okay, so so the, the, the gist is, is that take it from a Captain America aficionado, it's, a, it's an okay film. It's a... No, it is not an okay film. You are not <laughs> listening to me. It's a great <laughs> film. <laughs> wow. Like Godfather great? Like I Apocalypse like Now, great. I didn't like The Godfather or Apocalypse Now that much. You know why? <laughs> they were they were they were heavy hearted and cynical. Well, that's what makes great art, right? Oh, this is a tangent we can go into here. Uh, I want to go into this. That explains why you've never done anything great. Huh? Uh, exactly. Yeah. No, this is why I have accepted the fact that I will never, ever be considered a great, memorable artist because I don't do something like that. Or is that my way of making an excuse for being uh, a failure? <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, like, no, Peter smoke. Pan was very, very dark and cynical. and Right. Yeah. No, no. What about, what about Charles Schultz? Is there anything cynical about Peanuts? There's, there's plenty of detractors who line up to say that his stuff is sappy pap because he says happiness is a warm puppy. Right? And, well, and actually, yeah, if you... have money off of it, but the early stuff. Have you, have you, seen, the, uh, have you seen the one where it's, uh, they, it, it's Peanuts minus the last panel? Yes, I think so. <laughs> it's just because, you know, he usually turned it around in the last panel. So it would just be these three panels of horrible angst and then it just leaves it. Somebody has them on the, on the, oh, on the net. this yeah. is great. Read the Schultz biography. Have you guys read this? No. Oh, man. It's all... I can't read. <laughs> I can I write, but I can't read. Illiteracy. Yeah, so people, uh, people would question whether you're accurate about me being able to write. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That, 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 there's I, a, there's I a did, spectrum. I, I did my dissertation in the form of interpretive dance. Wow, nice. <laughs> it was hard. There were a lot of statistics, and they all tend to run together after a while. Well, and it's hard to hard, hard to do, you know, like a decimal point in interpretive dance. It's, well, tell me about it. Um, no, where I was going with the Schultz biography was, and I haven't finished it because I only got about halfway through before I And quit. his lips got tired. I, <laughs> <laughs> no, my heart got tired from all of the ache of that book because it's all about how tortured and what kind of horrible mommy issues that Charles Schultz had and he was always worried about abandonment and everybody's going to leave me and everything's going to go away and I'm so sad all the time and it was like wow really you made comics uh, weren't there any parts where you were like this is fun no no because you're an artist <laughs> per perhaps because he was Charlie Brown <sighs> but, 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 anyway, I don't know it's, it's, Charlie Brown had its up moments too right they had its moments where it was like oh that was funny or was it? Or are we always laughing at his expense? I guess I haven't sat down to analyze this. Are we always laughing at the kid? Hmm. What do you think, Tracy? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I couldn't really talk about this subject too well. I haven't read the book. I'm 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 mischaracterizing it. Probably I'm oversimplifying it. There's more to it than that. But the parts that jumped out. Me Did you those. see Captain America? <laughs> no, I have not. Not yet. Okay. 
<sighs> All right, I'll turn to a later. I'll, t- I'll change to a later note because I want to get the, the other fun uh, question in. Is that uh, uh, Alice, Tracy? What do you think of the new My Little Pony season? <laughs> <laughs> it's a I serious thought, question. <laughs> I like the the last Halloween episode. That was really cute with Luna. I believe they uh, have more Luna episodes after that. I need to go to uh, YouTube to look up the past episodes because I start. I went to the hub the other night to catch up on it, and only episode three of the season was available for the full episode download. Um, really, and did, and did you cry? No, it was a light. It was a light one. It was a good one. It was uh, Twilight Sparkle. Is no, like, no, I meant, did you cry that there weren't more episodes? <laughs> I was bummed out. I was. I was a little bit bummed out. And and you know what? Did what? Did, did your wife have to like hold you and pat the back of your head? <laughs> no, she's <laughs> there, 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 Jersey. Pony, pony soon, pony soon. <laughs> I just, I said, I want my show back. I want my show back. Yeah, just doing that over and over again. Uh, no, but you know what? I, I, I don't want people to start talking bronies in a second because, because actually, we can bring this onto the show. I haven't talked about this yet. Is that I find the whole bronies thing troubling, and maybe we can spiral that out to some talk about fandom and how fandom works. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, what do you what do you think of the whole bronies phenomenon, uh, Alice? Um, you know they're not hurting anybody. Yeah. So I think it's fine, but I also think that if the bronies were entirely female, that it would be treated with a lot less um, respect, I guess, for whatever respect bronies have. Mm. What What is a brony? <laughs> <laughs> Brony is a is a grown man like Jersey who enjoys My Little Ponies, but well, then how could he be female? <laughs> well, I think they've extended it so it's any adult who enjoys. Ah, that. <laughs> it, it, is it is it true though that Bronies before Honies? I don't know what, a, what what's a Honie. Now you're catching that's a head. that's an adult uh, woman who likes. Uh, my Little Pony. Oh. I just coined the term right now. That's right. Trademark. <laughs> check and check yeah. bait. Paul, Paul Story, Storyville.com. You heard it here first. It's an exclusive on Comics of Great. Uh, no, the... See, and, and there's a it, an old phrase, bros, before hoes. Oh, bronies before honies. See, well, that's you th- showing your Detroit street cred again. I'm here uh, in Ann Arbor where we're just... We just say, gosh, where's the newspaper? <laughs> that's, that, that's how you your town characterizes our town, and it's so false. <laughs> You don't got anything for that? Okay. Uh, no. no. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think anyone on this podcast is a brony, not even Jersey. So Thank you. So I don't know that we can really speak to that from the inside. Yeah. Well, Jersey is pretty much a little girl at heart. <laughs> you know, I don't have a problem with that, actually. I, I don't. I'm, I'm not saying that as a – I'm not saying that as, as a much pejorative. Of a, much of a pejorative. You, I, I have no issues with that. I always, I always thought the girls' toys were pretty cool, and I always, but was bummed out that they got so much cool stuff that we don't get. Uh, but uh, anyway, so maybe I was just ahead of my time. But uh, <laughs> are you kidding? So... None of our stuff even moved, much less had missile launchers. Well, yeah, the but Shiro toys were pretty neat. What? What? Well, yeah, they were. The Shiro toys. Yeah, and and see, Shiro toys were not only cool; they had swords and stuff, but then they had like glitter and things on them, and like 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 holographic <laughs> stickers on their armor and things like that. Pretty awesome. Not holographic, but you know what I mean, like reflective stickers, lenticular, something like that. Yeah, yeah. That that kind of rainbow sheen uh, plastic stuff that they used to. Yeah, it yeah. just looked cool. You know, I mean, anyway, I don't want to go into this. It's going to turn into a whole like let's let's analyze Jersey thing. But one of the things that I find troubling about the Bronies thing is that it. When it becomes almost uh, like fandom has like this arc, it seems like it's like you get like this this groundswell of people following something and supporting it, and it's really useful, right? Like so, like all these dudes gather on My Little Pony and say, "Oh my gosh, this show's actually really well written. Let's let's make some noise about it." And it, it, if you watch it, Paul, you're gonna see that it's yeah, it's a show aimed at girls, but it just happens to have really excellent characters in it, which will be a segue into our topic for today if we have time. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, it, it's. But then, then, then it turns into this thing where it's like now there's articles. Well, Brody's men who collect My Little Ponies. What is this all about? The freaks, you know? And it shows all these men with the collections of My Little Ponies in their house, and it, it, it tends to turn into a joke. And then it turns into like this code word between people, like, "Oh, are you a Brony? Are you a Brony?" And doesn't that like kind of work against the the the, the fandom around the intellectual property? I'm wondering if you guys could weigh in on that because if you turn it into like a silly thing like that. You know, it's like all I'm saying is that My Little Pony is good and it's worth watching if you really enjoy good characters. Right, because there's never been any mocking of fandom before. Well, yeah. There's, well, I mean, like, that's just it. You know, like the, the guy who just did the, the article for uh, uh, Men's Health 
was it oh was it men health or men's fitness i think it's men fitness magazine uh mocking uh cosplayers for not being fit enough basically oh well, they're skinny or fat or whatever and they're dressed up as superheroes and uh, and uh, well, men's uh, fitness is the first place I go to learn about intellectual properties. Uh, uh, but apparently, <laughs> he, uh, apparently, he w sold a very similar article to Maxim oh. like, not too long ago. So another one of those magazines that I go to for my intellectual yeah, property yeah. news. <laughs> but uh, but my point is that you know there's that whole uh, all sorts of fandom tends to get um, you know there's a, a certain amount of of geek chic now, mm -hmm. but there's still a kind of oh you know. How absurd! They they you know painted themselves blue and and uh, you know dressed up as Nightcrawler as opposed to oh they painted themselves blue, took off their shirt and put a letter on their chest so they could root for football. Right, right, yeah. So, but I'm not bitter, and that's what's important. I, I want to go. Oh, you, go ahead, I'll, Alice. Will not have you speak ill of football. I'm not. I'm speaking ill of football fans. That's fine then, yep. especially especially fans of the Philadelphia Eagles because oh my God. I used to love their albums. Yeah, well, I live in Philadelphia, and they're relentless, and they won't leave me alone. And now you know how I feel about living in Detroit, about the um, the the, the uh, black uh, red wing blackbirds or whatever they're called, the the hockey red wings. Yeah, sure, right, whatever yeah, those guys. Because um, you know that the, there's the whole stupid hockey town crud, and it's like I people people ask me when I move back to back. Uh, years ago, I moved to L.A., and so I was like, oh, you're from Detroit. You must love the Red Wings. So I'm like, why do you think I moved to L.A.? <laughs> I figured I'd get away from this. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't watch either. I'm I a baseball guess. fan. <laughs> I, don't, I don't watch any professional or coll collegiate sports. Oh. Well, okay. I want to hear Alice Wan on this thing. I, I think it was interesting, the point that you threw out, and we'll close it out with this, is that you mentioned that it might be taken more seriously if it, there were more girls who were called bronies. What do you mean by that? Well, that wasn't exactly what I was saying. I was oh, I was thinking more if if the bronies were, you know, just women, that it would probably be seen as, you know, like the, the sad middle-aged women who collect dolls and watch Twilight, that kind of thing. Sort of pony, pe pony women instead of cat women? I guess. I don't know what that is. A cat lady? Oh, that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I thought you were talking about, like, Catwoman. Oh, I'm yep. sorry. I, I can see <laughs> why you would. Is, is that really a subculture? Because I've been out of the loop. It is now. Have you been reading Batman? Hey oh <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to do it. I think they really nailed her characterization. Oh there. my god. <laughs> <laughs> hey kids, go check out Catwoman. <laughs> no kids, don't check, check out, out Catwoman. Catwoman. No. <laughs> Eighteen and older, please. Yeah, we'll uh, have to spray you with water bottles if you go check out Catwoman. Oh, bad Catwoman. Bad. <laughs> oh my gosh. So anyway, at uh, least naughty. Uh, that's no, but, for sure. But because it's you know college days age guys watching it, there is at least an element of I don't want to say coolness, but not as pathetic as it would have been. Really? Because I got the opposite perspective, or opposite feeling from it. perspective when all that stuff was first hitting, because, like, they had uh, Bill Clinton on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, and he had to talk about bronies, and I heard that, and it was just, you know. <laughs> I missed that was... episode. Did you? I have to track it down on the, <laughs> on the podcast. Yeah. Wow. It, and it was, you know, it was sad at that point. But, I mean, Wired now has a blog that talks about, uh, you know, oh, there's a new episode on tomorrow, you know, without any, any hint of, you know, tee hee, you're watching a program for children, mm. you know. So I just, I think it's interesting to see how these things kind of break down sociologically. So when men do things, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> When, when, no, when the 18 to 25 demographic does, does things, things, it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah let's, let's, let's not call them men. But. Oh, man. Males, <laughs> males between 18 and 25. <laughs> so, okay, so that's why I'm not a brony is because I'm over the age of 25. Is Obviously, that... you're, you're just sad. Okay, well, sad. I can live with that. Sad you're a enough. crony. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, with you know, with we, we've got about maybe seven to ten minutes left before we've got uh, our AEDL uh, spot coming up. So I'm That's wondering That's where you get to throw me out, right? Yeah, I get to kick you out, and then it'll just be me and the gals, and and uh, I'm I'm thinking Eli is going to be coming up. Uh, 
That's what I love about coming on here. It's like, ah, we'll stay with the rest of the guests. Paul, get out. I, <laughs> that's one of the reasons I want people to go out and tell their friends about comicsagreat.com and the podcast and give us a review on iTunes and tell your friends on Twitter. Because if we get enough viewers, then AADL is going to give me enough money to um, produce the show to create a trap door. So when it's time for <laughs> Paul to go, you'll just see me pull the lever and then <laughs> zip. And there I'll, I'll be doing the, like the Will Ferrell character from from uh, Austin Powers. I'm not dead down here, <laughs> but I'm sorely injured. That's all I want to see you do for now is this Will Ferrell character. I want you to be Buddy. I want you to come in here and just say, hi, I'm Buddy the Elf. What's your favorite color? And then scream after we drop you in the trap door. <laughs> so, Tracy, is this your first uh, <laughs> Comics Are Great? Yes. Well, um, being online, yes. Yeah, okay. And, 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 and are you finding it insane? Uh, it doesn't really seem all too different from the other shows that I watch and listen to. Okay. It's been well, a lot of fun. Except for the fact that last week we had Nick Abatsis and Jim Mataviani on here, and it was like this really awesome intellectual discussion, and then I get Paul and Alice on here, and it just falls apart. Uh, perhaps perhaps <laughs> you're <laughs> attributing to us your failings. Oh, is that what it is? Uh, no, because I was the common denominator between both, so... Oh, uh, yeah, but Jim has so much gravitas that... I, I think that he could even <laughs> overcome the black oh, hole that is. be intellectual if you didn't ask me about ponies and ball pits all the day. Yeah, yeah it's like, <laughs> Paul hey, Paul, talk about this movie. Hey, Alice, talk about bronies. And here's where it turns into Lord of the Flies. They all turn on me and they drop a rock on my head. I would if I could find you. Where, where is fifth and whatever? <laughs> So real quick, okay. So we only got a couple minutes. So let's let's try to dig into it like an actual topic. Uh, writing characters from a writer's standpoint. <laughs> designing characters, I think. Yeah, designing said. characters from a writer's standpoint. Because you know, a couple weeks ago we had Jake Parker of Agent44.com on here. He did an awesome visual demonstration on how he thinks about writing characters from a term, in terms of shape and defying shape and thinking about what shape informs and line informs and things like that. Uh, you guys have to describe characters. I want to hear from Alice and Tracy. What is the process? Of coming up with a character for good goodbye chains does does Alice give you Tracy like this long extended uh, Alan Moore esque description of the uh, character or is it something where it's like you know a couple sentences a couple paragraphs? Uh, you know she gives like a, a basic uh, description usually uh, about their height or their size and whatnot and uh, when I'm when I do have time. I try to do a couple character sketches to show her, but lately it's been designs done at the last minute, and then it seems to change while I'm working on the pages. I'm trying to prevent that with the next part. I'm going to try to do a lot more designs to get everything ready. But uh, yeah, it's just a few descriptions, and then we bounce back and forth if she likes it or not. Well, I think it's a little more involved than that. I don't say, Tracy, draw a guy with a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's more descriptive. <laughs> but it's not like a whole book just for a character. So. Well, no, but what I tend to do is I write, um, you know, basic physical descriptions, and then I'll go and find, you know, images of things like, well, he should have that kind of hat or this kind of pants or, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. I don't. A lot of it is I wrote the thing before I figured out exactly what these guys visually look like. So a lot of it is that their characters should reflect their characters, you know. So they should look like the kind of person who does this. Right. Mm. That makes sense. No, it totally does. This is something I run into uh, a lot of trouble with when I'm writing my comics is I tend to visualize the story before I visualize the characters. Mm -hmm. uh, and it becomes a real puzzle in figuring out, like, when I, when I work with a pre-designed pre character, like if I look at, like, an old sketchbook and I try to infer what the character's personality is from the image, that comes pretty easy. But when it comes to, well, I've got an idea what this character's personality is, oh, gee, what the hell do they look like? Uh, what kind of body type do they got, right? Or what kind of animal are they if it's an animal story or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Actually, he also... Whether it's an animal story or not, he's always wondering what kind of animal, what kind of animal? or tree. <laughs> what kind of tree would they be? Yes. And all of Paul's characters are weeping willows. Oh. <laughs> we, actually, we actually do that, too, with at least the animal thing, because it does help work them out a little bit. Mm. So for whatever reason, Colin is like a giant bunny like Harvey. Nice. <laughs> so you better explain that for those who have not seen it, because it's a black and white movie. No, it oh. depends which which iteration. 
There it, was, they, they did other iterations? They did a made-for-TV Harvey where they actually showed you Harvey. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh. But with James Stewart. Oh. Mm. Was that was that the the interpretation where he played it darker? Because I remember he talked about how he wanted to play Elwood P. Dowd like darker in some versions. I of the don't story. think so. Okay, he was still like the sweet guy. Yeah. But anyway, okay, so Harvey. It's a it's a movie about a man who has a giant imaginary friend who is a six foot tall bunny rabbit <laughs> who may or may not exist. Uh, that's a uh, six foot and one half inches tall. That's right. It's been a long time. And, and I, I'm not sure though whether that includes the ears or not. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't, I, I don't, they never specify. I don't think they ever specify. But anyway, yeah, so he's like this playful kind of spirit animal. He's a mischievous. Uh, mis is it mischievous a, or mischievous? It depends who's saying it. Okay. But he's a puka, P-O-O-K-A, -O -O from old Celtic mythology. And how are you, Mr. Wilson? Wilson. Hey, <laughs> who, on, who in the encyclopedia yeah, wants to know? <laughs> oh, we've watched that movie too much. I was, I played Wilson. <laughs> or I Yeah, I played Wilson in... Uh, my mm. high school production of Harvey. I would have I would have slated you for a Chumley. I you know, actually they had a better Chumley than me. Oh, and I really? Was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was as thuggish as they got in my <laughs> high school. <laughs> okay, but so let's get back to the topic. So designing characters, thinking about them as animals, but then also like a back and forth. What do you mean back and forth? So like Tracy, do you give like here's version one and then Alice gives you some feedback or is it is that how the interplay happens? Uh, often I'll uh, draw it first. And I really, I, I can't do research as well as she does. So I try to act smart, find my own research, and come to find out it's completely opposite of what it was. <laughs> so she finds all the photos and whatnot for me so I can try to get it more correct. Yeah, but oddly enough, the first time she ever drew Banquo was, like, perfect. It was, you know, his character entirely. I mean, she didn't, she didn't design him, but the very first time she drew him, she nailed him, which was kind of interesting. I, I, I had to write back and said, you know, never draw it any differently than this. And then she <laughs> changed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tracy's style has been evolving since she first started the book, too, right? For the better, I would say. <laughs> well, there was, there was a random period in the, the middle part of the early pages where, for some reason, Banquo gets really unattractive. Mm. I was trying to draw him more manly. I was trying to get away from the pretty boy style. And I just couldn't have him looking like a pretty boy until uh, the, the, the dream at the cabin when you told me, that's how you should draw him. That's how he should look. And yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to hurt her feelings. But <laughs> you should have said something. <laughs> yeah, now I know that. <laughs> There is a, there is a certain element where where when you're working as a writer with when you're collaborating, there's a kind of a I don't want to say I I I don't want to get too specific, don't want to be too controlling, because you don't want to um, you know have your art monkey fl fling feces at you. Mm. Art no, monkey. I'm kidding. I'm uh, no, but I mean that you don't you don't Storyville want to, com Storyville on the Twitter. Um, can draw art monkey draw. Um, <laughs> Uh, but no, you, you where you you do have that element of like you, you wanna you don't want to be kind of dictatorial, but you do want to get what you're what you're envisioning yourself. So there's there's a balancing act there. There's different schools though. I mean, Alan Moore has talked about, and he's famous for writing really detailed scripts that are longer than the actual comic itself. I, I thought he was famous for whining a lot. Oh, whoa! Hello, uh, DC. He said it. Hire him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I will happily write as many sequels to Watchmen as you want. <laughs> just, just keep the greenbacks flowing. Uh, no, but but uh, he 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 described this as not being controlling, but making it as easy for the artist as possible. That was his. his but that's that's the balancing act, though. Yeah. You have to you have to give the artist as much information as you can to make their job easy, rather than giving them so much information that you make your their job hard. Mm -hmm. um, and also, they, they're the artists. They should have some visual freedom. You need to leave that that opening so that they're not feeling chained, if you will. Oh. Yeah, if you look at um, the Alan Moore scripts that are in the back of that big Watchmen edition, the, uh, the absolute one that's double-sized or something like that, um, they have the script and then they have parts of it that Dave Gibbons, you know, highlighted to say, all right, this is what I actually have to draw. 
mm-hmm. not all this stuff about when this block was last paved. <laughs> yeah. You know. Right. I also love this idea of actually looking up uh, reference material for the artist. I think that that is, I mean, as, as somebody who works in freelance illustration, when a client says to me, can you draw a, a storyboard for this commercial that takes place in downtown, um, I don't know, you know, Charlotte, North Carolina, and they give me like a bunch of photos of the area, you know, and could you make the characters look like these people and they give me those photos too? Oh, that's, that's such a, a huge lift off my shoulders because it means I can get right to work. So yeah, that's, that's another thing that I think uh, perspective or aspirant is aspirant a bad word aspirant writers <laughs> well it's not like asp- aspiring not aspirant I think aspirant is like you know like uh, when you uh, you know like aspirating what was that's, it that's when you like, when sort you of throw up and breathe in your vomit oh well I mean that too <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> Either way. Yes. But I think you meant aspiring. aspiring. Yeah. Aspiring. You know, I, don't, I don't think I want to come on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> We're not gross enough for you? Oh, give us another week. It'll start getting all scatological. Uh, so aspiring writers, uh, is, is that something that uh, they should be thinking about, I guess? Yes. Collecting reference material. Yeah, I, I really like it when she gives me all this reference uh, I try to keep it orderly, and I think that's the hardest part. Uh, she gives me a uh, reference sometimes that are pages ahead, and I have a problem of forgetting, so I try to re- rename all my photos that I save to the computer, like uh, this is for the last page of the sequence, or this is for page 429 or something like that. Uh, but uh, I still have to ask her, well, was this what it was for, or was it this? <laughs> There's just a whole bunch of... Uh, stuff especially for these last few pages it was so pretty hard to uh organize yeah with historical stuff there are a billion tiny details that you have to have reference to because i mean even 1884 is not that long ago but it's an entirely different world from what we're used to i mean most of the stuff that we think of as being modern didn't really come around until about the 1890s so you know, if I want to have the characters eating a piece of candy or something like that, I can't just have them go down to the store and buy a Hershey bar because they don't exist yet, you know? Mm-hmm. So all these little tiny insignificant details that nobody cares about, I care about. So I have to keep throwing material at her, which oh, I feel bad about. Actually, it's nobody <laughs> cares about until you get it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. they're like, what? There is a guy who um, he, he helps us with train stuff. Because it turns out in the train sequence, um, we screwed up, which I have no idea about. But he told us, you know, why are you doing this? This rolling, this this was not rolling stock at the time, and it looked stupid. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> he was very upset. But it was also like the best letter we got in a long time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, we and we didn't want to screw up, so we're going to have to redo that if we ever do the story for print. So, I mean, probably only he will ever notice that, but, you know, he'll appreciate that we got it right. Mm-hmm. We should take this op- uh, moment as an opportunity to talk about goodbychains.com slash historicalnotes.html, which I'm <laughs> showing Paul. Uh, it is a long document that Alice put together on the site with all the historical notes of that stuff that's been going on. I noticed that Jersey stopped right where it said sex. Did I? Uh, actually, or maybe my eye just caught that. I think that's what it was, because uh, I was actually more interested in the floriology uh, with all of the Victorian uh, meanings uh, ascribed to plants. So, yeah, that's, oh, oh, that was, I, I that thought was it was twisting. Yeah, I thought it was talking about like floors. Oh no, uh, yeah. the you know basil means hatred, and bay leaf means I change but in death or soup. So, <laughs> so basil faulty. That, that's particularly appropriate then. Yes, it is. Yeah. So, okay, uh, we're at the end. Uh, I got I to gotta bring in my uh, AADL guest in a second here. So I want to take an opportunity for final thoughts. Uh, final thoughts on this. this. <laughs> on the 20 seconds that we talked about. <laughs> this was a great topic, Jersey. I really, I think we should revisit it. I think we should. Uh, anybody in the chat or who's listening after the fact, if you want to just send a, a message to uh, 
twitter.com slash comics are great or twitter.com slash jersey and say, hey, bring Paul and Tracy and uh, Alice back for that discussion because it was really good. I, I like that. And uh, Alice. <laughs> I, would, I, was, I was trying not to talk in Twitter handles. Yeah. Uh, it's, it gets difficult when you live in the internet world. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, trust me, I know. Alice is Hey Kids Comics to me all the time because that's the only way I communicate with her. <laughs> <laughs> So I was talking with Hey, hey Kids Comics the other day. What? Uh, yeah. Oh, Storyville was so, on my he nerves. He never again. talks to me. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> Jersey's a pathological <laughs> liar. He only, he only has me on when he needs to fill dead air. <laughs> oh, don't, don't, don't reveal my secrets. We should, we should do a podcast, Alice. Just you and me being scatological. And we'll, <laughs> with the We Hate Jersey Club. Uh, uh, we couldn't. We we would have too 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 many guests. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, every number episode, one on iTunes. Every, yeah. every episode would be about my laugh. Uh, okay, so uh, anything you want to promote, plug, or make some noise about? Otherwise, Paul, I'll start with you. Um, I, actually, I think that we we covered most of the stuff. At I the mean, top, we, we, my boyfriend's a monster. We do have my boyfriend's monster made for each other. By the way, just a reminder: it says number two on it. That is kind of what I call goosebumps numbering. In that it is the second book in the series, but they're all standalone books. Mm -hmm. They do not carry over. You do not read, need to read one to read two and so on. Um, and, yeah, uh, go, go and check out my, um, uh, uh, me on, on Twitter or at my uh, old blog, Quest, the l number four, success.com, uh, livejournal.com. Quest for success .com. Oh dear! Um, because, uh, <laughs> but I have the uh, but I have the previous order code for um, for the Muse, which mm. is uh, it's, it's a teen it's a, a teen superhero mythological villains mythological menaces and the horror that is high school. Sounds fun. So live so, journal. Live. Yeah. <laughs> Just just check me on on the tweeters at storyville.com. Uh, it, it's Storyville everywhere except Google Plus, uh, where it's Paul Story. No, actually, my 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 Facebook, or as my friend likes to call it, Buca de Facha. Uh, uh, I don't know why. Sounds fancy. Yeah, it does. You have to keep your pinky out when you do that. <laughs> um, and uh, that's that's Paul D Story. But okay. I I think about changing it to Storyville, uh, just because it's branding. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Like well, Chuck Connors. Oh, that's brand dead. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Uh, so, Allison, Tracy, what do you guys got going on that's worth looking at? Uh, I know Tracy's got the Tumblr. Yeah, I've been trying to update it a little bit more often than I used to. So, TracyWilliams.tumblr.com. Yeah, I'll try to keep doing that from now on. With any uh, notes that I take with goodbye chains or anything else that catches my fancy. And then, I'll try to uh, finish this week's page before the end of the week. Can't make promises, but after uh, this finishes and I ice the heck out of my leg, I promise I will get to work on the page. Please look forward to it. And that's at goodbyechains.com, an, uh, an updating webcomic series, which is uh, for, for grown-ups. Webcomics aren't just for kids, people. <laughs> I, I don't know why we didn't have, even have to say that. So thank you, Tracy, for being here, and thanks for putting Damn. up with us. I Thank you. Alice? Yes? What, what, do you, what do you got? What's worth looking at? Oh, absolutely nothing. <laughs> uh, no, I, um, I usually just use Twitter anymore because that's what I have the attention span for. Um, this morning I, I tweeted about a bunch of birds, so that was fun. How appropriate. Tweet. Um, I also have a story coming out in Smut Peddler, which is... Yeah. I think next June or something like that. I forget when it, it's coming out, but it's a it's a an, an anthology of pornography by a bunch of web comics artists. It's got um, and that's know, also for kids. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> um, it's got Spike from Templar, Arizona. She's the one that's um, putting it together, but it's got um, Tom Sedell from Gunner Creek Court and a bunch of other people whose names escape me right now. But I wrote a story and um, Deanna Ekanik. I'm sure I mispronounced her name. She is drawing it, so it's um, 1950s pornography. So hey, I'm I'm getting closer to the modern era. <laughs> and also, also goodbychains.com, which once we finish the stained glass sequence, we should go back to a uh, more regular update schedule. So, well, it's looking great, Tracy and Alice. It's it's a it's a beautiful story. Uh, well, it's beautiful looking. Uh, the what happens in the story, uh, we'll leave that to readers to decide if it's beautiful. 
<laughs> it could be it could be a, a severe beauty. Maybe we'll put it that way. You know, thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. Is that like saying to a woman, like, you're a handsome woman? Did I just do that? <laughs> but in terms of comics? Oh, no. Well, you could at least say it's, it's beautiful and that let people decide if you're wrong. Oh, here we go. Okay, you know? prove me wrong, people. Prove me wrong. Goodbye <laughs> Chains is a beautiful comic inside and out. Well, you know, and, and there's beauty that may not actually be nice. Sublime beauty, right? Yes. The I, beauty it, of destruction. Yeah. Sure. She sure. does draw a message. And now I'm going to punch Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> it's sublime. That would be sublime. Do it, Paul. Do it. Oh. <laughs> ah. And there Do it we like go. It's Rainbow Dash. <laughs> None of the Rainbow Dash hate. Okay. I don't even so know what that she's means. awful this season. She, like, electrocuted people at a Halloween party. Eh, I gotta watch who that hasn't episode. Hasn't done that. I gotta watch that episode. So I gotta get. I gotta let Eli in here because I'm <laughs> yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, we gotta kick Paul out. Let Eli in, and then we're gonna get some book recommendations, and we're gonna close out the show. But uh, yes, so Paul, thank you for being here once again. Always a pleasure, Jersey. Oh yeah! Wow, look at that. We shook hands on TV, everybody. Uh, oh, gross. Where's my pure? Trust me, it's a trick. <laughs> <laughs> Why are your hands so sweaty and small? <laughs> <laughs> Jersey is confusing his hands for my hands. <laughs> oh, I'm rubbing your glue. So, okay. So, uh, I don't, I think the, the next uh, calendar thing while Eli gets set up is if for those who are watching locally uh, at the Ann Arbor District Library, November 6th is the Ann Arbor Comics Artists Forum. It's a free event from 1 to 3 p.m. on Sunday, November 6th. We got Joe Fu from Desmond's Comics who's going to come in for a presentation for us. And, uh, then there's going to be some open drawing time. Great way to meet local cartoonists, network with local cartoonists, and uh, get some free education on your beloved medium. So uh, that's at AADL.org. Uh, click the events link and look for the downtown uh, events. So, hey, Eli. Hi, Josie. How's it going? Good. I'm happy to replace a sort of uh, uh, juvenile m mutual derision and <laughs> Rainbow Dash hate that was happening in here. I don't know what Alice's <laughs> issue is with Rainbow Dash. I really don't. It, it, it <laughs> mystifies me. Is that she's terrible. <laughs> She's, she's just See, what I like about Rainbow Dash as an example for my kids is that it shows that cool people can be assholes. <laughs> and that's an, important, that's an important lesson. Cool isn't always about, you know, and sometimes she's contrite, you know, but rarely. But it's like, yeah, it's like Rainbow Dash is the self-absorbed one. That's an important phenotype to have in your collection of human so personalities. Rainbow Dash is that friend that you wish would stop being friends with you, but she never will. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, well, I'm glad that we went there. Uh, <laughs> so what do you have for us in terms of uh, books? Today? I just brought a couple things, you know, and I was really enjoying the conversation earlier, and, you, and the question you asked was, uh, uh, what is the, the, the liability value of your fandom to intellectual property? It's you a know? much smarter way to put it than I put it. Well, and I think that it's, it's a really good question because, you know, with the bronies, you can definitely see there is potential, uh, there's potential negative brand impact. If, you know, if the wrong TV executive visited 4chan on the wrong day, that would be a really bad day for My Little Pony, you know? <laughs> yeah. But the flip side of that is I think we have more examples now of fandoms being a critical asset to a brand. When you sure. think especially about Seth MacFarlane and, and, uh, and his Fam stuff, yeah. you know, I mean, his shows have come back from the dead repeatedly solely based on the power of his fan base. Same thing with Futurama, very similar oh, yeah. sort of situation. And I think now that's television. It's different. And, you know, mostly because television, much more so than comics, requires the blessing of a large investor, you know, someone to throw a lot of money at it to get it happening. Um, but I think that there's the fan base clearly is something that can make or break the continued success of a property. And I think that, you know, what's most interesting about it is that with, uh, you know, specifically Family Guy and Futurama, um, that was not a goal. You know, there, there was no leadership from the people behind the property of those fan bases. True. You know, at the most, it's like, hey, go buy our DVDs. We have an important meeting next week. You know, I mean, that's like the most that it would be. Yeah. But really, they were fan organizing. And you remember there was the, uh, the, the brown coats tried to buy out Firefly. You know, that was, mm -hmm. if that could have happened, that would have been a really big thing. And I know they got some progress, but I don't remember how we, Yeah, we've out. talked about this when you were on uh, that full episode a couple episodes ago, where yeah. we were talking about uh, the episode was uh, titled Just Be Interesting, where we were talking about fandom and its roles, uh, at least in the tertiary way we were uh, covering that. And we had Kevin Coppa right. of Avatar The Last Puppet Mender on in an episode where, I mean, he was spearheading a fan-generated right. movement. 
and, and, and there was an interesting post just read by Jeff Jarvis who wrote that book Public Parts and mm -hmm. he was talking about how the book these days is becoming the artifact of the conversation you have with your constituency uh, yeah. and I thought well that's an interesting way to look at it like can we map this onto creators of fiction and then can a product can the book be um, can it even exist without the fandom but then that brings in this whole aspect of something that the author has little control over ultimately right. and a little control over what that will reflect on what the intellectual property yeah. is right yeah. i mean and you know uh, but at the same time it's like you get some reverence in there like yeah, you know sure. if lauren foss said bronies knock it off you know yeah that would that something would happen you know yeah. they'd figure out how to react to that official thing i mean it's kind of like you know, it's kind of like if Luke Skywalker made a, a public forum comment in in a star. You know, I mean, yeah. it like would carry that much weight. You know? Right. <laughs> it's like in Galaxy Quest, where it's like, I knew it, I knew it. It's real. It's all real. So, okay. and you know, the other interesting thing about fans, I, and I grabbed a couple things off the shelf that might have something to do with this, is that you know, you know, as your fan base grows, things that wouldn't previously have been monetizable become monetizable. And I got an excellent example of this off the shelf. This is a book of. R. Crumb drawing on placemats in oh, the 90s. Wow. And because his fan base and his acclaim, and of course he's you know a hugely talented and freakishly weird and intriguing guy, um, but this was his doodles on placemats at various restaurants across France was a marketable product. And you know, there's just some really great stuff in here. Oh. Whoops, I'm not showing it, showing it to the, the big camera here. We'll show to you guys. There's, you know, just some super cool illustrations and you know there's no narrative there's no story this is waiting for food restaurant placemat drawings by our crumb that's awesome and when you get to a certain point that that becomes something that your audience wants to have i know several of my favorite comic creators i'd be interested in, in a similar sort of thing um and kind of like go and this is something again it had a limited print run it's out of print you know but it's here at the library if you're looking for it um, then I grabbed two Harvey P. Carr things, which were two of his last projects before he died. Um, one is The Beats, A Graphic History, which is just a super, you know, one of the things that's lost about Harvey P. Carr is that he kind of, he, you know, he started as a fan. Like, he wasn't just writing comics about going to the bathroom and falling down the stairs and that kind of stuff. He started out as a jazz critic and someone who liked to collect records. And, you know, everyone who's seen American Splendor kind of knows that part of the story. But... He's really good at it. He's really good at the cultural criticism. And it kind of gets lost because he's, you know, weird guy and what was he doing on Letterman and all that stuff. Yeah. But he does such an amazing job telling the story of the beats in this book. And, you know, he wrote it and then he also has some stuff. Whoop, there goes. Uh, yeah, no problem. Um, he's got several contributions from actual figures of the time, like Thule Kupferberg, who was one of the founders of the Fugs, which was one of the uh, – major sort of countercultural acts at the tail end of the beat era. He wrote his own story and Harvey Picard kind of turned it into comic panels and then they had an illustrator draw it out. So, um, oh, was, and the script was actually by Jet, the illustrator and Tully Kupferberg himself wrote this together. So it's like people telling their own stories through this other project and it's just, it does such a great job of telling the whole story of the beats. Look at this great panel of Allen Ginsberg looking really mad. <laughs> you know, there's just some some cool stuff here. So is this, this is by a bunch of different artists? Uh, yes, well, yeah. you know, like uh, several of Picard's bigger things. Most of it is Ed Piscor, who we worked with a lot, mm -hmm. but it's also got, it says Jay Kinney, Nick Thurkelson, Summer McClinton, Peter Cooper, Mary Fleener, uh, you know, mostly uh, not huge names, but people that, that he worked with a lot and very all kinds of interesting stuff. And then this is uh, adapted by Harvey P. Carr, Studs Terkel's Working. Oh, wow. And this is so nicely done because, you know, Working is – it's it's a big work. It's got a lot of really interesting stuff in it. And again, Harvey P. Carr as editor pulls out some really interesting things, works with some really interesting artists and gets just some some fantastic – stories and it's just the text is just the text from working so it's not like he's adding anything in here he's just selectively choosing the right stories to go with it and uh baking it into a format that where because you know i mean harvey really understood comics and mm -hmm. comic pacing and he got the stuff put together in a in a very cool way so those are another things that you'll probably find at your library uh, Studs Terkel Working, edited by Harvey Picar, and uh, The Beats, A Graphic History by Harvey Picar, and Waiting for Food by R. Crumb. And links will be in the show notes. Thanks yep. again, Eli, for bringing that. Uh, anything that you want to make some noise about going on to ADL? Uh, well, we've got uh, our Arcade Master tournament series is starting to heat up. We actually have an event uh, for people who are local. 
Uh, November 4th, which is a week from this Friday at North Quad, we'll be having a combination Halo Reach and Arcade Master Qualifier Tournament. And then on January 6th, here at the Downtown Live, we're going to have a very special event, the Arcade Master Championships, which will be for people who have gotten in the top scores by playing these old games like Frogger and Galaxian and things like that. And then uh, we're going to have a live chiptune band. We're going to have uh, – it's going to be a pretty special event. So, oh, And wow. the prize is an iPod with an iCade attachment – an iPad with an iCade stand. Oh, for wow. It. Wow. So those of you who are locals, please check out. Yeah, uh, adl.org or emigrate, move here because this is this is a good yes, town for nerds this is where and geeks. It's all happening. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, thanks again, Eli. Thank, Thank you, you, Alice and Tracy. Oh, one more thing, I want to throw out a little plug for myself. This is the last week to participate or sign up for the thirty classes and thirty days event at leanintoart.com. Uh, every new sign up that we get this week, we're going to it's going to uh, create a random unlock of one hour of open office time. So with each new sign up over the next week, you'll be adding more office hours to the event. Uh, a class every day, uh, online workshop, uh, comic storytelling and illustration uh, through the month of November. So 30 classes in 30 days. It's going to be super fun. Leanintoart.com is where the information is. So. Okay, thanks again, everybody, for downloading and listening. The show will be broadcasted next Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time at the uh, at comicsgreat.tv out of the Ann Arbor District Library. Thanks once again to the Ann Arbor District Library for putting this show on. Until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of uh, comicsgreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.